Today we have uh, John Carroll, who's a visiting professor here in our department, has taught a number of cultural anthropology courses for us, and his PhD is from Michigan State in 2013. So he's going to talk a little about that, and also a bunch of other projects that he's been doing in cultural. And his topic is, his title is Anthropological Insights Using Agent-Based Modeling and Geographical Information Science. So without more ado, here we go. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you all for attending. I appreciate you coming to hear about what I uh, enjoy researching. And I've had a great last couple of days. I've had a chance to meet a lot of different uh, uh, people and, and talk at a, in depth at a, a level I haven't had a, a chance to previously, so I really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to draw from one of my experiences from yesterday, talking with Dr. Condren, where he said, Okay, tell me what you do. And I threw out a bunch of terms, and he was like, no. <laughs> tell me, just really simply tell me what you do. And so since I just finished my dissertation in August, I'm in that, I'm in that space where you may not realize exactly that people don't really know what you do. Uh, so put simply, I'm an anthropological archaeologist, and I I'm interested in Native American prehistory, and I use a series of computational tools to allow me to tell stories at a more satisfying level than I would be able to do otherwise. Is that better, Dr. Condon? <laughs> Thank you. So, um, what I decided to focus on, I'm, in, I'm interested in social exchange and integration and interaction in, in small-scale communities. So how that translates to research here in the region is that I looked at um, archaeological ceramics that dated to a particular period in time, uh, about A.D. 1200 to 1400 in the Great Lakes region of North America. And so all of these uh, stars that you see here, those were uh, collections, those were locations where collections were retrieved and I did ceramics analysis on the archives. Okay. And so this is just kind of a geographic context. Um, Oneota, Middle Mississippian, Fort Ancient, those are all archeological cultures that are surrounding uh, the people that I, I looked at, which are the, the spring, we call them the spring wells, they didn't call themselves that. Um, but that's, that's the archeological term for, the, for the, uh, the people who lived at this time. So, uh, my time in the Anthro Club and in, uh, in talking with students has, has allowed me to formulate a, um, I think, a, a process in which to talk about ways to do research. And so when I talk to students, I say, I say how, do you, how do you come up with a project? How do you do, get to a point where you can do something? And I say, well, first you gotta figure out what you want to do. Then you got to figure out how you're going to do it. And then the final piece is, why should anybody care? Right? Because we all do different things. So that's the structure that I'm going to use today. My uh, research, research objectives for this project were, I was interested in assessing the degree to which people living during the Springwells phase were integrated into a social network. How were, how how closely integrated were they in the region? Again, this is a very narrow point in time, AD 12 to 1400, that I'm looking at. I was also interested in, in enhancing our understanding of Native American social networks and how information flows through them. Most people don't. Uh, they, they, they address questions at a single site level or maybe a, a, a single set or a, a series of sites in a local locale. I was interested in a regional picture of how information is moving around. And along with that, if you're going to understand how information flows through a social network, then you also have to address the social context in which people are interacting. Uh, because
because of this particular moment in time in pre-contact Native America, people are organizing themselves in a form of socio-political uh, integration known as small-scale or middle-range societies. And there's a real question as to which type of integration we're looking at. So small-scale integration is often associated with uh, hunter-gatherer bands, groups of 25 to 30 people moving across the landscape, uh, regardless of the point in time. Middle-range societies are often characterized as, uh, some people refer to them as tribal societies, larger groups integrated anywhere between on the order of 100 to 500 people in the classic anthropological literature. Now, that changes as you move through time and you get into the contemporary context. But when you think about the anthropological literature, that's what we're talking about. So how does information flow through networks you know, with different layers of complexity? We don't have a good feel for that, at least prehistorically. So I told you what I was interested in doing. Now I'm telling you how I, how I was going to do it. This is my research design diagram. I'd like to start at the theoretical level, uh, or the thematic level, and progress down to the uh, analytical technique level. I was interested in, in uh, looking at social interaction integration in the Great Lakes region of North America. I used a multi-theoretical social framework to do that. I'll explain that uh, here in a moment. The analytical methods that I used were uh, combination of ceramics analysis, so looking at artifacts, and creating a computer program for me to elaborate on that explanation once I completed my ceramics analysis. And then uh, looking at particular, coming down to the technique level, looking at particular techniques to be able to make sense out of these methods. So I'm going to go through all that. For you. So I've gone through what I was going to do and how I was going to do it. Now the question is why. This is a really understudied period in Great Lakes prehistory. And so when you get into post-81,000, we don't have a really good picture of what's going on here. A lot of that has to do with uh, a lot of these sites that date to this period under Detroit. Okay, they're not around anymore. Um, a lot of it's been destroyed. Where they'd like to settle has been uh, has been changed. There's also, <coughs> because of that, there's a small data set problem. There's not a lot of stuff that dates to this period. And so archaeologists have traditionally ignored it. So that, the question becomes, what do we do with these data? They're sitting in museums, you know, stuff's in museums, but it's not a lot of stuff. So do we not do anything with it? Do we not tell this part of the story? A Native American heritage? Is that what we do? Well, that's what people have done, and I didn't like that much. Uh, and also, I was interested in exploring this methodological potential. What can computational methods do for us? How can it allow us to tell a more satisfying story? Um, archaeologists are very often uh, oriented toward the material objects of stuff and explaining the social process processes behind the stuff. But you don't see a lot of uh, computational archaeology going on uh, throughout the field. I wanted to explore what can we do with this technology. My thought was that the simulation technology in particular, once we understood what we had, artifact-wise, we could use the simulation technology to uh, explore social context of interaction, which, you, you know, you can't really do with a, a single set of artifacts on an artifact. So as I've said, the, these technologies aren't typically used in archaeological investigations. When they are used, they're often employed uh, in evolutionary models to show, for example, um, you'll see a lot of talk about cultural transmission and ideas reduced to the level of a virus, for example. Or, and that's okay, I mean, you know, that's satisfying to people. It's not to me, but it is to some people. Um, and and uh, it, or or cultural transmission as uh, analogous to the genetic transmission, which is not satisfying for me. 
for a number of reasons, but you know, so for example, um, I can't do a lot with my hair. I'd like to, but I can't do much about my hair. All right, I, there are limits to what I can do with it. Um, culture is always fluid; it's constantly changing. People are active participants. To reduce culture to gene flow makes no sense to me. So when you do see the stuff used, it's typically employed in, a, in an evolutionary scheme of a state and then change and then I didn't like that a whole lot. It took people out of the story. This technology that, that I use, I see as valuable because you can actually highlight, highlight human agency and intentionality and decision making, which is a very different thing than saying, oh, we had an idea and then people were immune or not immune. And so uh, that's why I really like this technology. The end goal is this. This is, and this I would say, not just for this exploration, but what I'd like to contribute to the discussion, writ large, is to highlight the flexibility and adaptability of Native American communities. That's, that's my ultimate goal. In other words, to help add a, add a dimension that allows people to think about Native American communities as active agents in their lives, communicating with each other through artifacts, as I'm going to explain here in a minute symbolically, at multiple social and spatial scales. The payoff here is that when you do that, people can start to think about Native American communities as people, active agents, instead of reduced to the racist uh, stereotypes that we see, it still is pervasive all around us, even, even now. So that multi-theoretic framework, theoretical framework that I talked about earlier, the overarching theme I'm using the complex systems framework. If you're not familiar with complex, uh, it's sometimes referred to as complexity theory. If you're not familiar with complexity theory, it's a different way to look at science. So we're trained uh, generally, as we're, we come up through the academy, that you know, you, you, you we're trained in uh, reductive techniques to go to the, the smallest part of a problem to understand a phenomenon, or start at the level of the phenomenon and reduce it down to the, its lowest constituent part. Okay? That's great, unless you want to understand interaction. Okay? And, and so that's what complex systems is really useful for. I know you're going, how does that, how, bring it into something that I can use a little more concretely. I think about it this way. Think about, for example, um, I'll go with a pro team because I don't want to offend any of the, you know, college, any particular college. Let's go with the uh, a Tigers game, okay? And think about you're you're in the stadium and all of a sudden a wave starts and propagates through the stadium. All right. If you follow a traditional reductive model, you're going to look at that. You're going to you're going to look at what's going on and then you're going to zoom in on a single seat. And what are you going to see? You're going to see a single person going like that and sitting back there. It's a very narrow way to look at things. If you want to understand interaction, you have to zoom out to the, to the system level. And that's what complex <coughs> systems theory allows us to do, but it's tough to do. So it requires very intensive, in my mind, it requires computational approaches to get to that kind of analysis. Then embedded within the model that I go on later to develop, um, I'm looking at cultural transmission theory, diffusion of, uh, diffusion of innovations theory, uh, which is how uh, ideas or products or services are adopted throughout a system. And ultimately, uh, at the individual level, I embed information exchange theory into the agents in my model to help explain how stuff, how designs move around 